Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's KSA uh, webinar uh, on seizure prophylaxis in neurosurgery. My name is Dr. Ifra Hersi. I'll be moderating the session uh, uh, on today's uh, topic on seizure prophylaxis in neurosurgery. Uh, first and foremost, we'd like to appreciate KSA webinar organizing team uh, and all the participants uh, who, are, who are attending the webinar. Uh, whether from Kenya or from out of not within uh, out of Kenya, uh, around Africa, we have different anesthesiologists also attending. So we highly appreciate you attending our webinars, and uh, let's all learn from each other. Um, we request kindly request that you have any questions for Dr. Njogu throughout the presentation. Uh, just write it on the chat box, and from there we shall answer all the questions after his presentation. Uh, in case you want to ask a question. Uh, I tell you to use the anime of where you can raise your hand. And uh, then from there, we can be able to pick on the person and uh, you, we can unmute you. And then you're able to ask your question to Dr. Njogu. So you may not be able to unmute yourself, but uh, once you raise your hand, we'll be able to unmute you and you'll be able to talk. So either you can drop the question on the chat box, we can see it and we'll ask the questions. Or if you want to ask the question yourself, just raise your hand and then we shall choose you from there. Okay. Uh, Dr. Jogu is a neuroanesthesiologist uh, who has been working at the Kenyatta National Hospital, which is the main referral hospital uh, in Nairobi, Kenya, for those who are not in Kenya. Um, and he has also been supervising and mentoring residents in anesthesiology who are from the University of Nairobi. And uh, sharing quite a lot of knowledge that he has in the neuro theaters. Uh, these students rotate at Kenyatta Hospital with uh, Dr. Njogu uh, when they do a neuro rotation and in also other rotations. And he has supervised a lot of them in their thesis, theses, we can say that. So thank you, Dr. Njogu, for that. Uh, he also is a part-time lecturer at uh, Al Khan University Hospital, uh, where he also mentors residents in anesthesiology. Uh, so I shall be inviting him to start to start us off. Let's give Dr. Jogo a minute or two uh, so he can be able to start us off. Remember that you can always get the recordings of our CMEs on uh, Facebook, on YouTube, on the website. They're usually uploaded by the next day or in the course of the week. Uh, so you can always get that from there. So let's wait on Dr. Jogo. I hope I'm clear enough for all of you. And... Uh, uh, Dr. Njogu can start us off once he's ready. Welcome to this webinar. Uh, my name is Dr. Jogu, as I have been introduced by Dr. Hasi. Uh, thanks for the kind words. Now, today, we'll be discussing the seizure prophylaxis in neurosurgery. I want to state it clearly that I am not a neurologist. Uh, neither am I a neurosurgeon. I'm just a, a gasman who has some interest in patients who have uh, neurosurgical issues. So let's first look at uh, terms, which sometimes, as simple as they may look, look a little, uh, sometimes get confusing when discussing this issue and why I, I choose the term seizures and not epilepsy. Now, seizure is a clinical manifestation of an abnormal and excessive excitation uh, coupled with synchronization of uh, a large group of cortical neurons. So that is what, what we see is the manifestation of, of the, the excitation and the synchronization of the excitation. Now, epilepsy as defined is the tendency for these to recur and provoke. So when you're having a seizure, which is unprovoked and in repeated, then that is when we are talking of a person having developed epilepsy. The provocation may be either systemic or maybe focal as uh, we may have uh, uh, acute or even uh, prolonged uh, neurologic insult. So when we are talking of post-traumatic seizures, we are talking of seizures which are a consequence 
of brain injury. Now, there is a definition which is arbitrary and which is neither, uh, it's not based on any science as such, but it's what we have been using, where we say that if you have an, uh, a seizure within 24 hours of injury, that is referred to as the immediate uh, post-traumatic seizure or PTS, as I will refer to it during the course of my presentation. Now, when you talk of early seizures, we are talking of um, seizures which occur within a week of injury. And if the seizures occurs more than one week after the injury, then we are talking of late, uh, late PTS. Now, there is what we call the post-traumatic epilepsy. And this is when you have uh, epilepsy uh, as a result of which can be a consequence of the brain injury. And post-traumatic epilepsy account for 13% of all, of all epilepsy, epilepsy cases with a known cause. Please note, it's not of all cases of epilepsy. We are talking of the epilepsy, which you can define the cause. So 13% of those, you can get it back uh, from the PTS. Now, what is the process through which we get uh, these seizures or what uh, some characters may refer to as uh, epileptogenesis? Now, there are two things that must have been, uh, must be in place. There must be neuron hyperexcitation state coupled with hyperexcitable networks. And the hyperexcitable networks are important because as you, as you remember during the definition, I said that there must be synchronization. So there, for there to be synchronization of these uh, uh, depolarizations, then there must be the network which is connecting the different regions. Now, hyperexcitation may be as consequence of a number of things. One is an increase of uh, excitatory neurotransmitters. Uh, often when we are talking of uh, neurotoxicity, I, I think we have discussed quite a, a lot about the release of uh, uh, glutamate, particularly is the main culprit when you come to, to excitatory toxicity. So there may be an increase in release but another reason where you may have an increase in uh, exotoxic neurotransmitters uh, may be enriched metabolism by the glial cells because there is an uptake of the, of the glutamate by the glial cells. But if particularly in injury state, there may be deranged metabolism, okay? Hyperexcitation may also be a consequence of changes uh, in ion channels in terms of their numbers and distribution. Remember for depolarization to take place, you have the opening of sodium channels, the potassium channels, where you have the sodium running, uh, uh, getting into the cells, potassium leaving the cells and so on and so forth. And there are other ch uh, channels which also have a role to play in either hyperpolarizing neural tissues or depolarizing like the, eye, the, the calcium channels as well as the chloride channels. So if you have a change, of the ion channels, the type as well as the distribution, you may end up in a hyperexcitable state. Some biochemical mo modification of uh, receptors may occur, uh, particularly the NMDA receptors. Okay, uh, we are for our necessities, and NMDA receptors are a great thing because that is where some of our drugs work. But it's also through the same receptors which are excitotoxic when uh, they are bound by like glutamate, okay? Then activation of the circuit messenger systems, these often lead to changes in ion uh, channel, uh, which may change the movement of ions across the membranes. Another state which may lead to hyperexcitation changes is a change in extracellular ion concentration. And that's why particularly in ICU or when we have patients who are critically ill in any position, we are always worried about the concentration of the extracellular ions. Particularly big couplets is a sodium and magnesium, okay? Now, 
we leave the hyper excitable state, how do we develop the, the, uh, the generating hyper excitable networks? And how do they come to be, particularly when you have trauma or uh, insult on the brain tissue? The neurons, uh, we know that they, they continue, they can regenerate. Neurogen, neuronogenesis continues up to late in life. And when there is an injury, the, what we refer to as a, the brain plasticity is as a consequence of continuous uh, neuron genesis. So when there is injury, there is a sprouting of axons. And these may be where we may have an imbalance between the, the sprouting of the excitatory as compared to the inhibitory axons. Okay, so when you have that imbalance, then you are establishing networks which can actually now sustain uh, the synchronization of the hyper excitable states. Um, then the, during when you have trauma and insult, and particularly when you have ischemic states of the brain, you may have loss of uh, inhibitory neurons and the inhibitory circuits. Remember that within your cortex, you have the interneurons other than the pyramidal cells. And these interneurons, a uh, significant proportion of them have the inhibitory effect and which keep uh, the depolarization in check. So if you have the loss of inhibitory neurons, then uh, you may have uh, development of hyper excitable states. Now, the inhibitory neurons do not just work on their own. They are actually driven by excitatory neurons and uh, which are now create a state of uh, a negative feedback. Now, if you have a loss of the excitatory neurons that drive the inhibitory neurons, then you still end up with an inhibitory, uh, a hyper excitable state because you no longer have the drive to inhibit the depolarizations. The, during the healing, you may have configuration uh, or change and remodeling of the synapses as well as what I have alluded to earlier, where you have changes in the glial cells, uh, which may, uh, their, their ability to metabolize as well as uptake the excitatory neurotransmitters may be impaired. So ultimately you create the state which any depolarization can actually uh, continue and you have there is no inhibition because you are still, you're having a state where the excitatory neurotransmitters are not being removed from the receptors or within the environment of the receptors. You have changes in the synapses, which means if uh, the release of the neurotransmitters may be disinhibited, or you have the uh, ultimate loss of the inhibitory circuits and you create now the circuits which are hyperpolarizing. Now, and that uh, whatever I've discussed as the basis of the epiptogenesis becomes important in understanding why when you have development of uh, post-traumatic seizure foci, the drugs we administer to stop or as management of uh, the post-traumatic seizures may not succeed in actually stopping the process of development of post-traumatic epilepsy for a patient who had post-traumatic seizures. Because these drugs may not exactly work or be able to inhibit the mechanisms that generate the hyper excitable networks. That is the basis of me, or the reason behind me trying to explain how we generate the hyper excitable networks. Now, what are the risk factors for developing PTE? The reason for me discussing this is uh, the fact that 
the drugs we have, uh, I'll be talking about it later, are quite efficient in actually stopping post-traumatic seizures, the early post-traumatic seizures, but they are not very good at stopping the post-traumatic, uh, the late uh, post-traumatic seizures, as well as the post-traumatic epilepsy. So there are least factors for patients who actually have injury to the brain developing post-traumatic epilepsy. And these are patients who are extreme of ages, uh, particularly patients who are aged more than 65 years of age, patients who have chronic alcoholism. There is some genetic predisposition, as we know that uh, the epilepsy of unknown origin has some familial tendencies. Then there are those which are injury related, and this is important because you need to know which patients you need to categorize as high, high risk, and therefore whether you need to give them the anti-epileptic drugs. Patients who have severe trauma as defined by the Glasgow Coma Scale. Patients with penetrating head injuries, patients with intracranial hematomas, uh, depressed uh, skull fractures, hemorrhagic contusions, patients with severe enough injury to require neurosurgical procedures, comatose patients, patients who develop uh, early post-traumatic seizures are at an increased risk of developing post-traumatic epilepsy. Uh, patients who have had TBI, uh, traumatic brain injury previously, are tend to have to be at higher risk of developing post-traumatic epilepsy after a subsequent traumatic brain injury. So that, so it's, uh, the risk becomes cumulative. Uh, patients who have focal neuro image, uh, imaging findings or EEG findings after acute uh, injury are also at a high risk of developing post-traumatic uh, epilepsy as compared with the patients who don't have focal uh, features. Now, how common is uh, or uh, post-traumatic, uh, how common is post-traumatic epilepsy and post-traumatic seizures? The incidence of post-traumatic seizures in all types, and I kindly note it's all types, that I'm um, talking of mild, moderate, and severe head injury patients the risk of you developing uh, post-traumatic seizures is about 2 to 2.5%. This will change uh, depending on the kind of injury that you have, with the highest being in the patients who have high-velocity projectors. For, uh, for, uh, for example, patients who have had gunshot wounds, uh, their risk will be much, much higher as compared to patients who have had a concussion when they were playing soccer. Now, when you look at the ones who are admitted, the risk of post-traumatic seizures double. We tend to admit patients who have moderate or severe head injuries. So patients, if you combine the severe head injury patients and patients who have a moderate head injury, the incidence of post-traumatic seizures increased to about 5%. If you look at uh, at severe head injury patients in isolation, the incidence increases to about 10 to 15% for adults and 30 to 35% in children. This is according to a study done in the United States. For in a Norwegian study for mixed group, uh, for both adults and children, the risk uh, for post-traumatic seizures was about 23%. There is no much difference between the two rates. If you combine the two and get the average, you end up around the same figure. <clears throat> so basically that is where you, when you are looking at moderate, uh, at a severe, sorry, a patient who have severe traumatic brain injury, the risk. And kindly note, the risk is much, much higher in adults, uh, sorry, in children for ARI, uh, post-traumatic seizures. Well, the post-traumatic seizures, late post-traumatic seizures are more in older patients. If you 
can recall the slide before, I stated that the risk of uh, post-traumatic epilepsy is much higher in the older population, older than 65. That is the same, same thing being stated uh, using different figures, okay? So, but note that children are at a much higher risk of developing status epilepticus following post-traumatic seizures. The reason for giving this is to try to categorize your patient when deciding whether you need to give prophylaxis for, patient, uh, for your patients who have, uh, who have had or who have suffered any insult to the brain, that when you're looking at a child, the risk of that child developing status epilepticus following a, a seizure is much, much higher as compared to an adult. The risk for that an adult who is more than 65 years uh, getting late post-traumatic seizure, which is, as we said earlier, is uh, after a week, is much, much higher than for a younger person. Uh, now, when you have patients who are alcoholics, they may develop alcohol withdrawal. So you may not actually know whether you are dealing with a patient who is developing a conversion as a consequence of alcohol withdrawal, or they are developing the seizures as a consequence of the neurologic injury. But having said that, as I stated earlier, the risk is of post-traumatic seizure without necessarily withdrawal is much higher among the alcoholics as compared to the general population. Now, for the post-traumatic seizures, the, the, the most, most of them will occur within two years of the injury. And the risk of developing post-traumatic seizures uh, normalizes to the population average within five years. Now, in the United States, uh, traumatic brain injury is, uh, is a major cause of symptomatic epilepsy in patients who are aged uh, between 15 and 24. Just it's the same, same age group, of course, which suffer most of the traumatic head injuries. They are the ones who ride motorbikes without helmets, and they are the ones who are likely to speed on the highways. So they are most likely going to get traumatic brain injuries and the consequences of the same. Now, how, how do we, or how is our situation in our Republic? Definitely, we don't have any data on post-traumatic seizures or post-traumatic epilepsy. But uh, probably we can try to, to dig our figures from what is published. There was a paper published on, uh, in Lancet Neurology, which looked at the active epilepsy uh, prevalence in our country. And uh, it came up with a figure of about 4.5 per 100 per, uh, per, uh, per thousand in the population. Now, when they looked at that, they looked at the associated factors, the main factors contributing to this active epilepsy for those they could identify was previous head injury, perinatal events, uh, as well as family history of the same. So basically, we are, uh, despite the fact that we don't have figures for post-traumatic seizures and post-traumatic epilepsy in our, in our setting, head injury, was found to be a major contributor, although it was not quantified among his patients who had active epilepsy. If we look at our hospital, the Kenyatta National Hospital, which is our main referral hospital, uh, in an audit done over a period of about four months, it was observed that 11% uh, of all admissions were a consequence of head injury. Now, there is a caveat here. Uh, head injury is a very big term. It is all inclusive. All those patients who have uh, a cut on the forehead, which may be deep enough to warrant 
uh, admission are classified as head injuries. But uh, when we are talking of, of uh, post-traumatic seizures, we are talking of patients who have brain injury, who have traumatic brain injury. So the figures of traumatic brain injuries are not very clear. So as much as uh, the figure of 11% was derived from that audit, it is not clear whether those patients were admitted because they had brain injury or they were just part of, the, the, the brain injury patient were just part of the 11%. So now uh, going back to that slide, we can, if you look at the risk factors of uh, post-traumatic seizures, we have identified that alcohol is one of uh, the factors or risk factors of developing post-traumatic seizures and even post-traumatic epilepsy. A, majority, a good a significant proportion of the patients who we admit in Kenyatta National Hospital have uh, often have taken a good dose of alcohol and probably their injury are a consequence of drunk driving. So just you, you can try to fit in the profile of the patient you receive or you see uh, and try to classify them according to the risks that I have raised uh, in the previous uh, slide. Now, how do these patients uh, present? Post-traumatic seizures are usually focal or secondary generalized tonic chronic. So they are not primarily, they are not primarily generalized tonic chronic. Remember we said one of the risk factors is a focal neurological injury. So basically they will usually start at the foci and either remain as focal seizure or become a general uh, or become secondary general stonic chronic. And majority of the early post-traumatic seizures are partial, uh, partial seizures. And this is very important, particularly for those people who deal with children, because we need to be careful. And uh, because uh, as we said, the early post-traumatic seizures are much more common among us, the children, and they will be partial. So we need to be observant, particularly for those children who may either be in artificial or they are in coma because of their injury. The, most of the post -trauma, late post-traumatic seizures and the post-traumatic epilepsy, they also are partial onset with or without secondary generalization. Now, the presentation of the post-traumatic epilepsy. Now, remember this is post-traumatic epilepsy. We are talking of unprovoked recurrent seizures. Uh, their presentation depends on the location of the injury. Those patients who suffer injuries in the motor area who tend to how to develop post-traumatic epilepsy much earlier as compared to patients who develop, uh, who have injuries in other regions like the temporal as compared to frontal. So yeah, that's something also you need to bear in mind when you're uh, assessing patients. Now, if you get a patient who just has a mild traumatic brain injury, who develops early uh, post-traumatic seizure, they are commonly associated with intracranial bleed. And this, particularly for those uh, people who are like most of us practice in some resource poor setting, and we often debate on the economics of doing some of these imaging, like uh, CT scans. If you have a patient who just came, had mild seizure, had a concussion, and this patient is now awake, and you are even thinking of sending the patient home. If that patient develops a, con a conversion, then you don't actually, even if they, after the conversion, they, they are awake, just remember there is a very high risk that your patient has an intracranial bleed, and therefore it will be criminal 
for you if you ever send that patient home without uh, neuroimaging. 10% uh, of these patients may present with status epilepticus. Remember what I said about children, particularly children with early PTS, they are likely to develop status epilepticus. Uh, often, if you have status epilepticus, you need to find out why your patient has developed status epilepticus. Sometimes we are more concerned with controlling the, the status than finding out why the status does exist. Often, if you have those, if you check, you may have developed regions of ischemia. And remember what I talked about, the epileptogenesis, the role of ischemia is prominent. It is where you have an increase in release of uh, excitotoxic neurotransmitters, derage glial cells uh, uh, performance with the deranged metabolism of the neurotransmitters, and even the, the process of generation of the, um, the hyperexcitation networks develops with the ischemia, with the neuro, uh, neurogenesis. So you need to dig, you need, if you get a patient who develops status epilepticus, please find out whether there are metabolic derangements, including of course, the electrolyte imbalances that may have led you to, um, may have caused the child or the patient to go into status epilepticus. And probably you need to image the patient and find out whether there is a good reason why they are developing ischemia. Is it that there is an increase in intracranial pressure, which is causing a decrease in perfusion pressures? Or is it because your patient is actually hypotensive and is not perfusing? Or is it for whatever reasons the patient has gotten some vasospasms? Uh, if you are doing, of course, uh, EEG, then you can see the early uh, uh, seizure abnormalities. Okay. And this will be how if a patient develops each or uh, develop some EEG changes, even without developing PTS, those are the those patients are at much higher risk of developing the post-traumatic epilepsy. Now, the common images we do, of course, when you have a patient who has a seizure, is the neuroimaging. You need to do a CT scan, and sometimes, we, if possible, an MRI, of course, is better in defining the soft tissues. The laboratory, we have talked about the electrolytes. The changes in the, the electrolyte milieu is an important contributor to uh, hyperexcitation state. Then you have the EG. Now, if EEG, of course, is the best thing you can do, particularly if, if you have a patient who is common to host. Now, this is particular, so for patients who are either in coma, either artificial, that is you have given sedatives, or the patient is in coma because of the severity of the traumatic brain injury. Up to 50% of comatose traumatic brain injury patients will develop non-conversive seizures. Therefore, an EEG is very important. I have always said that if you put a patient into artificial coma, the only way you can rule out your patient is conversing is by doing a continuous EEG. Continuous EEG uh, in ICU setup, particularly, is plagued with a lot of problems. Remember, EEG uh, mic is measured in micro reports. There is so much interference in ICU. There is so much electromagnetic activity in ICU generated by all sorts of monitors and devices that we use in ICU. So, continuous EEG is is pricked with a lot of problems in an ICU setup, but it's the only way you can actually be able to detect majority of those patients who develop uh, 
or who are who have traumatic brain injury and they are in coma and if you decide for whatever reasons you have decided to put the patient into artificial coma uh, if for example you are trying to, you have patient who has refractory raised intracranial pressure and you are using barbiturate coma as your uh, conservative management protocol then a continuous EEG, as I've said, is the only way you can know whether you are achieving what it is that you aimed at. But other, uh, other patients who are not in barbiturate, those who are in barbiturate coma, of course, they are very unlikely they will develop a conversion. But there are those people who, who sedate patients slightly and then paralyze a the patient in ICU. If you do that, the only scientific way of knowing whether your patient is having non uh, uh seizures is by doing a continuous EEG, which is pretty difficult. And that is why some of us are very much against use of paralysis in our setups where we can't do continuous EEG on patients who have traumatic uh, brain injury. Of course, there are uh, clinical signs which people use to say that whether they can suspect whether their patient is having a seizure. If you have a patient who was who is probably awake, not sedated, if the patient becomes somnolent, or if uh, the patient is agitated, then you may be dealing with some conversion. Remember, there are so many other reasons in ICU that can give you, or for a critical care patient to become agitated or to become drowsy, or for the blood pressures to go up or the heart rate to go up or the patient to develop a fever. These are very non-specific, but for resource poor setting, probably they may provide you with an idea that, but very non-specific. The only thing that you can do to actually detect those seizures, if they are non-conversive, is to do an EEG. There is uh, something, I'd, uh, maybe I go back to it's uh, what you call video EEG. It was, it was just there for, it is used not by us in ICUs, but probably by neurologists and a psychiatrist. And the video EEG is for trying to rule out patients who have psychogenic epilepsy. Now, what's the history behind management of the seizures? The seizure management started a long, long time ago. In the 19th century, people who had epilepsy or people who had conversions were regarded as outcasts and they were taken to what we are called workhouses or medical asylums where they would be locked there. The main thing is that one of the things that was so-called associated with uh, seizures was sex. So basically they were being removed from that. Now come 1857 and potassium bromide was brought and uh, it started being used. And 1912, the breakthrough phenobarbital. This is a drug which is still used particularly by our, our pediatric uh, practitioners uh, to control conversions. It is uh, a drug which is more than 100 years. So now during the First World War, uh, they started the prophylaxis with the potassium bromide and, uh, bromide and phenobarbital for victims of uh, who had head injuries as a consequence of war. Remember we said patients who have penetrating head injuries are at a much higher risk of developing post-traumatic seizures as well as post-traumatic epilepsy. And because of that, that is when actually the issue of prophylaxis was popularized by the, the, the First World War. A lot of things as much as we do not like to acknowledge a lot of good has come out of the war. Of course, and a lot of bad because people died, but at least they started. Now the two year prophylaxis, remember what I said about the occurrence of the first seizure after traumatic injury, majority of those, injury, of those seizures, up to 80% will occur within two years. And that's why probably despite not knowing, they started the prophylaxis for two years. Now, uh, during the Korean and Vietnamese wars, that this is now uh, we are coming to up to the 70s, 
we have the introduction of the phenytoin, the drug that most of us are still using. And they started the prophylaxis. And it's during this time that the issue of early and late post-traumatic seizures came to be. And people started questioning the duration of prophylaxis. How long are you going to give this prophylaxis for these patients? Now, uh, come uh, in the 80s, we have had, the, there was introduction of carbamazepine and sodium valproate or epidemic as part of the prophylaxis. So, and recently we have many other drugs which have come to be the, the Kepler's and uh, and the rest and the micto of this world have come to be in the thousands. Now, the question you need to ask yourself is, do I need to give, uh, uh, we, we encounter these patients who have a traumatic brain injury every time, either as an emergency coming in for evacuation of hematoma, elevation of depressed skull fracture, uh, insertion of uh, external ventricular drains, and so on and so forth. And of course, uh, most of us anesthesiologists in, in this part of the world are also the ICU practitioners. So we are the ones who, who still manage those uh, patients who have severe traumatic brain injury in ICU. And we need to ask ourselves, uh, do we need to give prophylaxis? And how can we answer this question? The first thing is that, is a seizure harmful? I know that probably somebody may wonder whether I'm mad or not. Why am I? Uh, seizure looks like it's a very bad thing which should be controlled. So we normally uh, give medicine to control it. But it's always very important when we are delivering any treatment that we assess the benefits of any treatment that we give vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the harm that that treatment may cause. In this particular case, is, is, is giving, are the drugs totally safe or it does giving them, does the benefit of giving them outweigh the risk of giving them? That's one. Then you ask yourself, do all types of injury, do the patient, as a patient who is in front of me, really need an seizure prophylaxis? And if you decide yes to the two, then which drug do I use and how long am I going to give it? Now, sorry. As far as seizure prophylaxis is concerned, there is seizure comprom compromise recovery. There is actually no unequivocal evidence that treating seizures improves your outcome. There isn't an equivocal evidence. However, based on what we know and uh, what seizures can do, one is that seizures will raise the intracranial pressures physically. They will increase cerebral metabolic rate, which will cause an increase in cerebral blood flow and which will further raise your intracranial pressure, and God forbid, if you already had critically elevated intracranial pressure and you increase it further, you may end up coning, you will further compromise uh, perfusion and you increase the lesion of ischemia. And as we have said, the lesion of ischemia, the ischemia itself promotes the development of those uh, epigenic networks. So basically that seizure as it is probably as much as we don't have unequivocal evidence that 
it's harmful or or uh, affects outcomes, then probably from basic science, it will be prudent for your patient not to have seizures, particularly that critically ill patient who may have a critically elevated intracranial pressure with reduced cerebral perfusion. Now, there is definite evidence that generalized status epileptic arrest is associated with worse outcome. Now, this is the true story of the chicken and its hen. A chicken with its eggs, who was there first? Is it the seizure, the generalized status epilepticus, which causes the worst outcome? Or this patient, actually the injury was so severe that they ended up with status epilepticus. But going back, and uh, particularly looking at the category of patients who have said that they are at a higher risk of status epilepticus, the from post-traumatic seizure, particularly children. You may want to actually look critically at a child before you deny that child anti-epileptic uh, uh, anti medication as prophylaxis. Because if we know, because this is, this, this is there in literature, that the general status epilepticus in patients who have suffered traumatic brain injury have worse outcome than those who don't, then probably you'd like to prevent or do something to prevent development of general status epilepticus. Now, remember also we, I say that patients who, have, who are in coma, whether artificial or because of their neurologic injury, up to 50% of them will develop non-convulsive seizures then probably you need to think about those, that group of patients, despite the fact that I have said there is no unequivocal evidence for isolated seizures other than for status epilepticus. Uh, these are the kind of injuries that we encounter on a daily basis, probably. I just wanted to look at that. So you want to risk, uh, uh, categorize the risk. This is a... Um, a table I obtained from uh, a review of um, anti-seizure prophylaxis by in the, I'll give you the reference at that from the Journal of Neurosurgical Anesthesia. Uh, it's the latest review, systematic review they had. And for traumatic brain injury, the incidence of early onset seizures is between three and 21. Remember, but what uh, we had given those figures earlier. So is there evidence for seizure prophylaxis? No, but remember what I have just said. This is the rate of three to 21 is for general traumatic brain injury patient. This includes those patients who get concussion when they are playing rugby. To that patient who arrives in Kenyatta with a grassy coma scale of five after he has been bashed by thugs, and you can't tell which, which uh, was the brain and which is the blood in, the, in that head. So basically those two are very different patients. Their, their risk of uh, getting conversion is, uh, uh, conversions or the seizure, post-traumatic seizures is very different. So as much as this was a systematic review where they aggregated all the patients in a single group, you may need to analyze your single patient as an individual and individualize that prophylaxis as much as we are saying there's no evidence for the general uh, statement of saying you need to give a prophylaxis. Now, patients who have, if you are doing um, craniotomy for probably a meningioma, the risk is much, much higher. And you'll find probably majority of these patients, by the time you are encountering them as an anesthetist, they are already on one or two anticonversants. Patients who undergo craniotomy for non-trauma reasons, uh, there was no data available. Subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, these are patients who are at differential risk of 1.3 to 11%. There is 
an argument that the release of uh, ion from uh, or on the or, uh, on the brain service actually contributes uh, to seizure development. So basically, when you have the rates of 1.3 to 11 percent, this one probably is dependent on how much blood you are having on that particular bleed. Because you'll have patients who have probably a less than one millimeter thick uh, subarachnoid hematoma or a patient who has a very thick hematoma. Those are two different patients, and probably you may have to individualize their risk. Those who get spontaneous intracerebral bleeds, you may, you may not. Patient with ischemia, their risk is much higher. Remember, we have said ischemia and development of uh, the networks for, for seizure development. Now, you go back to your patient who may be having traumatic brain injury. A significant proportion of them, if they have severe traumatic brain injury, may have region of ischemia because of a compromised perfusion due to probably raised intracranial pressure. So you, as much as we are saying there is no evidence, then the ischemia makes uh, makes it uh, important for you probably to consider giving prophylaxis to these patients. I will not look into the rest because these are, as I said at the beginning, these are mainly for the neurologist. Now, what have the society said about the prophylaxis? The American Academy of Neurology says that adult patients with severe TBI the phenytoin was a drug that was looked at at that particular point in time. And they said it decreases the risk of uh, early post-traumatic seizures. So that one is not in doubt whether you can decrease the risk of pro early post-traumatic seizures. However, this does not decrease the risk of you developing late PTS or PTE. If a patient develop post-traumatic epilepsy, they need long-term treatment with anti-epileptic drugs. I think this has been known for a while. So I'm probably just preaching the gospel which has been sung by many others. The Cochrane Review found, which was done in 2001, uh, found more or less the same same story that uh, there is no evidence of use of antiepileptic drugs using late uh, PT, uh, PTS that is post traumatic seizures or PTE or affecting death or neurologic disability and that is why I was saying we don't have according to that Cochrane review. There is no data to say that preventing the seizures or not preventing them will affect the outcome. But as I've alluded to, that may not be entirely true from, may not be entirely true when you individualize your patients. Now, how come that these drugs, they are very good at, uh, or they are good at preventing early post-traumatic seizures but they seem to fail miserably at preventing late post-traumatic seizures or uh, post-traumatic epilepsy. My, there is no explanation, but my thinking is that if you look at these drugs, all of them without exception, they all aim at preventing either depolarization or release of neurotransmitters. If you look at at uh, phenytoin, it's, uh, it blocks the voltage-gated uh, sodium channels. If you are looking at sodium vaporate, which we use, uh, it will block the same and also has GABAGIC effect. GABAGIC is an inhibitory circuit, so it will tend to increase, in, increase the inhibitory circuit activity and therefore prevent the development of seizures. If you look at uh, levitracetam or uh, Kepler, 
as we know it. Uh, it is does in, uh, it, it, it prevents release of the neurotransmitters at the synaptic level. So basically, when you look at the epileptogenic or the, uh, the development of the hyper-excitable networks, none of those drugs works at that level. None of them is trying to help the glial cells continue taking up the glutamate and removing it from the neuronal or from the synapses. None of those drugs is modifying the axonal sprouting and or changing the balance of the excitatory and the inhibitory axonal sprouting. None of them does that. So none of them is targeting those mechanisms, okay? None of them has anything to do with modification of receptors. So ultimately, the rate uh, post-traumatic seizures are a consequence mainly of these sustained hyper-excitable networks which have developed over time. Remember the early is because you have this hyper-excitable state with increased excitotoxic uh, uh, neurotransmitters, but the Maintain, to maintain that or to get to the state where you have later seizures, you may control the earlier seizures by just uh, controlling the membrane priority and the ability of uh, excitation to cause depolarization. But there is development of hyper-excitable networks which takes a while and none of these drugs targets that. That is, that's not what is, uh, that's not their argument, but that has been my hypothesis. So, so what is an ideal anti-epileptic drug? Because you ask which drugs do you give? Just like uh, when we entered uh, anesthesia course, we were told the properties of an ideal anesthetic. So the properties of an ideal AED or anti-epileptic drugs is that it should be broad spectrum, and should be able to take care of seizures of all types, whether they are uh, partial or they are generalized. Should have a good safety profile. It should have desirable kinetics. So a good drug, one should take it once a day. Should not have active metabolites. Should not have, should have uh, no limited or no drug interactions. Idiosyncratic effects should not be there, and should of course be available in um, different formulations, intravenous and oral formulations, so that if the patient is not taking orally, you can give it parenterally, and then when uh, the patient is able to take it orally or is in that state, you can move away from the intravenous. Now, we have many drugs. Now, a caveat to the drug which has been tried to be described as closest to the ideal uh, anti-epileptic drug is Revitracetam, the Keplan. Now, there is a review. The review I quoted, I quoted about uh, from the uh, uh, Journal of Neurosurgical uh, anesthesia or anesthesiology tends to promote, it's a review, yes, it's not a drug uh, pamphlet. It's a systematic review, which was, it's the latest review, I think it was done in 2019. But from that review, uh, which tends to promote Kepler or Levitracetam to being the closest to a, an ideal AD is that five of the papers which were included in that review were drug sponsored. So sometimes as much as we are looking at reviews and meta-analysis as the highest and the best forms of, of evidence, we need to think twice before we, we quote them. So you need to read that paper knowing that five of the papers 
which uh, are quoted in that paper were uh, drug sponsored and they were sponsored by the manufacturer of Kepler. So yes, the Vistracetam has is good drug for both the, the partial as well as general seizures. It has a, a relatively good uh, safety profile. I'm going to look at the safety profile of uh, anti uh, epileptic drugs. And the, the main actually selling point of this drug is usually its kinetics. That uh, one, the bioavailability of both oral and intravenous is 100%, or so they say. It's the Hello? Hello? Uh, yes, Dr. Njoku, we can hear you. Somebody, you can go ahead. We somebody can admitted you. me. <laughs> okay, sorry for that. So um, so basically, it is, it is, it's not metabolized. Uh, metabolized. Um, it's excreted uh, by the kidneys. It doesn't have much drug interaction because it, it doesn't uh, modify hepatic metabolism of other drugs. And here, of course, we are talking of uh, P450 enzymes. So basically it doesn't interfere with that. So you will not have to worry about modifying the dosages of other drugs like we worry about when we are giving uh, phenytoin or or we are giving sodium vaporate or carbamazepine. And its idiosyncratic uh, reactions are limited, not that they are not there. So basically, um, yeah, so that, that is the closest they have come to a drug which is quite uh, almost ideal. Somehow, sorry for this. Sorry. So uh, you need to have an idea of some of the side effects of the drugs that we commonly use. The commonest drug in our setup is phenytoin. Uh, phenytoin and the main problem with phenytoin, it's a good anticonvulsant and it has a broad activity. But it, the neurocognitive effects of phenytoin and the, the, the neurocognitive impairment, which actually lasts for a prolonged period of time, is what has been the main problem with a lot of these drugs. These are is both for phenytoin and even for sodium valproate. The maybe a phenytoin much more than sodium valproate in terms of its effects on the uh, cognitive compromise. And that is why it, it, if you are going to give a patient phenytoin as your drug of choice to prevent seizures, then you really need to justify its use. Because remember, the, this is a, a neurosurgical patient. This is a patient who you are managing so that you can improve their neurological state. Now, if you, on top of that, give them drugs which is going to impair your neurological state, then there is something wrong somewhere because you, it's like you are actually compromising or uh, compromising your care, and a lot of people are now shying away from use of the same drug. Uh, the other issue of phenytoin particularly after these patients have left the ICU, is a cutaneous reactions. And, and particularly so when those patients have uh, had going radiotherapy. In our ICU, we have also observed quite a number of patients who develops almost uh, the Steven Jensen syndrome in our, in our unit as a consequence of use of phenytoin. The hepatic derangement is there. 
and interference with metabolism of other drugs. This slide is very busy. That's why I'm, I'm, I just don't want to go through it state, uh, state by state. You can look at it later. But those are the main issues that we have, particularly with the use of phenytoin. That cuts also on, uh, on uh, use of um, sodium valproate. It may be milder, but the effects are more or less the same when it comes to neurocognitive dysfunction, reduction of cytochrome P450, and all uh, and uh, neurocutaneous uh, or cutaneous uh, syndromes. Levitracetam has less or markedly less neurocognitive effects, and that is why it is seen as a better drug. Okay. It also has some cutaneous effect, but not as severe as, as a phenytoin. So probably uh, it is something to consider. However, having said that, whenever you are going to give a drug, yes, uh, you have decided you need a drug to take care of the seizures. Yes, these are the, drug, the options I have. You also have to consider the cost implications. Uh, definitely, rivitracetam in our setup is beyond reach of a lot of patients who are in the public uh, domain. But probably, if you are working elsewhere, uh, then it's a drug to consider. And as we move forward, probably something which we need to get people to agree. Uh, our the powers that be be able to buy for us and be, be able to give our patient. But remember the paper I have said, which reviewed and actually recommended use of levitracetam. It's a systematic review, which was had five papers, which were industry sponsored, that's a caveat. Now in the, aid, in the use of AEDs in ICU has its own issues and it's challenging because majority of these patients are there because they are very sick. They are not there because they need a room to sleep. Now, these patients may have drug metabolism impairment, either because they are having some form of hepatitis, maybe they suffered hypoxia, uh, uh, hypotension, and even uh, uh, impaired perfusion to the liver at the time that they were admitted, or they may be on other drugs which are also impairing drug metabolism. Okay, these patients will be, may be hypothermic, maybe they have issues of uh, temperature regulation, impairment of acid base or the acid base uh, balance. Majority that's why we do uh, blood gas analysis on daily basis in this in patients in ICU. Patients may be having some renal dysfunction or they may have uh, an augmented renal clearance for whatever reasons. And now when you look at the drug that uh, we are saying like levitracetam, which is um, excreted purely through the kidneys, then if you have renal dysfunction, you may have to change the dosing. If you have re a, a augmented renal clearance, they, like those patients who are in ICU and they are on continuous renal uh, replacement therapy, then it becomes also a problem and you need to probably adjust the doses. The volumes of distribution and cardiac output are always a, an issue in patient in ICU. The total albumin concentrations for those drugs which are, uh, which are protein bound and if you are in advanced places where they are using extra corporeal circulation, then it, it's also a challenge. So that means probably you need to work with a pharmacist to be able to modify the drugs that you are given, the dosages. Now, in conclusion, I think I've talked for almost 40 minutes. When you are deciding on whether you need prophylax, you are a patient who has uh, uh, traumatic brain injury and traumatic brain injury may be as a consequence of an accident occurring or because you are doing surgery which is traumatizing the brain. You need to assess the risk and decide whether your patient actually needs your 
the, the AEDs. Uh, as we move forward, we need to consider having a continuous EEG for those patients who are comatose. And as I've said, consider use of levetiracetam, but I have given the caveat. Now, as I recommended, if you are doing prophylaxis, please let's remember if you have decided your patient needs to have prophylaxis, you need to taper off your drugs after seven days, because after seven days, you are dealing with a different ball game. You are dealing with uh, late uh, post uh, 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 post-traumatic seizures and prophylaxis has been shown to actually to be of no use. So the minute you start developing, say, uh, you, uh, if the minute you have closed day seven after the trauma, the drugs you are giving have no role. They are not of any use to the patient other than to the company where the drugs are coming from. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Njogu, for your presentation, uh, your never-ending fountain of knowledge that you've already shared with uh, everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome people for some questions. I've seen some questions on the chat. As I said, you can send our questions via the chat, or if you want to ask the question, you can raise your hand, and uh, we shall unmute you to be able to answer to ask your question. So I'll start off with the first question from Dr. Umani. Uh, thanks, Dr. Joe, for presentation. Should traumatic brain injury patients be administered seizure prophylaxis in ICU, even if there is no past history of seizure at the time of trauma? That's the first question from Dr. Omani. Now, as I've said, maybe I'll go one by one because I might my memory still fails me. So if you say uh, you give too many questions, I'll forget. Now, if you are, as I have said. The patient who comes to ICU has no seizure, has traumatic brain injury. Is that a question? Yes. If the patient has, if the patient has traumatic brain injury, then it is advisable for you to assess the risk. If this patient is in coma, for example, we have said fifty percent of those patients who who are, who are in coma. And majority of our patients who come to ICU who with traumatic brain injury is because they are in coma. Then 50% of them will develop non-conversive seizures. So seizures which we will not see, but which will have physiologic impact. And therefore, it's a patient who is at a very high risk. And therefore, I would advise that that patient gets prophylaxis. Yes, if that is a question. Uh, thank you on that, Dr. Njoku. I hope Dr. Omani, you've gotten your response from that. Uh, we shall go to the next question. Uh, this is from Dr. Devlak. He says, children prone to fall frequently in their early age and their skull bones are soft to absorb the injury. These children don't have early symptoms. So what type of head trauma to be followed up? Uh, so I think he's asking what type of head trauma you would categorize this as. So, um, as I said, the ch ch children who, who, who have severe traumatic brain injury, let, let's be, be clear, we are talking of the ones who, who we are seeing who have severe traumatic brain injury, have a higher risk of developing post-traumatic seizures. And they are the same ones who are at a higher risk of developing, developing even status epilepticus at that particular point, or they may go into status. So if you're having a child who has traumatic brain injury, who, which is severe traumatic brain injury, then those are the children who may need prophylaxis. However, the child who fell and woke up and maybe was taken to the, uh, uh, had probably lost consciousness, had a concussion, lost consciousness, is taken to the hospital, has no focal uh, neurological injury, 
then there is absolutely there, there there will be no education for that child to be given prophylaxis. I hope I've answered the the, the question. Uh, Dr. Devlak, I hope your Dr. Njogo has answered your question uh, towards the children. Uh, there's one other question from uh, Stephen Chebi. Uh, please comment on sedation of such patients for procedures like MRIs. Uh, before Dr. Njogo may speak, we are doing sedation next week uh, on, our, on our CME, sedation and, uh, on, and on different procedures. So maybe Dr. Njogo can comment a bit about the head injury patients on sedation for procedures like MRI, but you'll get more information next week on sedation. So Dr. Njogo, maybe you can comment something on sedation with head injury for a patient. Now, the, if, if you are going to sedate a patient who has head injury, the, the question I will ask is, what is your neuro, the neurological status you're starting with? Because if you have a patient who is already obtuded, then the patient actually most likely is intubated. The only the only problem I'll have is you if you give if you do something that will impair respiration of the patient and cause an increase in CO two, or give anything that increases cerebral metabolic rate like our good drug called ketamine. So if you are sedating those patients, the uh, traumatic brain injury patient. Whatever you do, do it, but do not cause the patient to have a raise in, in, uh, in ICP, or oh, no, in the CO2 or an increase in cerebral metabolic rate. If you do either of the, uh, if you do neither of the two, then you are doing it right. Okay, thank you for that, Dr. Jogu. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Would anyone? There was someone who had raised his hand and then I think brought it down. Is there anyone else who has a question for Dr. Njogu regarding the topic? Go on and go ahead with your question. I was asking yes, go ahead. for a patient who has had brain surgery due to a brain tumor, for how long will you give post-operative post prophylaxis for antiepileptic drugs? Okay, now the patients who have had uh, who undergo craniotomy for brain tumors are actually at a very high risk of developing post craniotomy seizures, or actually they are already having seizures. Those patients are usually treated like they have, they, they are actually like they have epilepsy. If they had uh, seizures uh, preoperatively, then they just continue with anti conversants you will give it intraoperatively and it will continue postoperatively and it may be continued for a prolonged period, even up to two years until the neurologist is comfortable with it. So you are not going to, this, that falls completely out of, uh, of what I was talking of early and late. These patients are going to be immediately, uh, even pre-op, they are on anticonversants, Intraop give you anticonversants, post op continue with anticonversants, and they will continue with the neurologist afterwards. They are treated Thank like they have epilepsy. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, is there anyone else who has a question for Dr. Njoku? I see some of our colleagues also who had joined in earlier um, from Hargeisa and from Burundi. Welcome aboard. I hope you really learned a lot from Dr. Njoku. Professor from Republic of Benin, uh, West Africa. Welcome, and I hope you did learn quite a lot from Dr. Njogo. Um, thank you everybody for attending the CME, those from Kenya, not with those out of Kenya. Uh, and I hope you all learned quite a lot from Dr. Njogo. He has quite a lot of knowledge, especially on neuroanesthesia and neurology, uh, neurosurgery cases. Uh, a few announcements from KSA. Uh, just a quick reminder for everybody is that uh, this is a CPD accredited uh, webinar and you shall get your CPD points. Those are for the Kenyan doctors. You shall get your CPD points via email uh, for the nurses, the clinical officers and the 
Kenyan doctors. You shall get a certificate sent to you from Shellmith uh, in the course of the week. Uh, this is also a recorded uh, webinar, so you can get it on Facebook, YouTube, and also on the KSA website. And uh, you, can, you can watch it again if you'd like. Uh, we also have some great news ahead uh, from KSA. Uh, I don't like to talk much into it, but I'll let uh, Dr. Lee Ngugi talk more on it. I think we've all been waiting for this news as uh, anesthesiologists in Kenya and maybe also those around. So Dr. Lee Ngugi, we'll welcome you in and you can go ahead and give us the very great announcement that we've all been waiting for. I'm the secret Vice Secretary of uh, KSA. Uh, wonderful presentation. Um, now, uh, we are having our annual conference coming this uh, August. The dates are 18th to 20th. Uh, with the new dispensation, uh, this will be hybrid. Uh, it means uh, anyone can join from any corner of the world. And it also means uh, whoever will want to travel to the site, it will be at, um, it, it will be, uh, I, I hope uh, someone said, and it will be at uh, Mombasa, uh, the beautiful hotel called uh, Pride in Shanzu. So you're most welcome, both physically and uh, virtually for this uh, great event that brings together more than 300 uh, you know, participants, uh, members from industry. So um, feel most welcome. You can get the details of uh, the fees from uh, Shellmeet and uh, soon they'll be put up in the website. And uh, you know, uh, please join in and uh, make it a successful event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nguki. Uh, I know everyone has been waiting to find out if you're going to have a physical conference. So there you get it. Uh, we will do have a physical conference and also it may also be online. It may be two in one. Um, as I said, thank you everybody for attending uh, our webinar. We shall be having our next webinar next week on sedation, uh, next week on Thursday on sedation. Uh, so please join us then also. And uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Njoku had to step out. He had an emergency. So uh, on his behalf, uh, he was also thanking all those who attended the webinar. Shelmith, uh, back to you. I think we should be able to end the webinar.